into a subject that I absolutely adore. Now, that is probably one of the most repeated statements in some of my videos, but <laughs> when you grow orchids, there are very, very few topics that I address that I actually don't like about the orchid hobby, but new growth is not one of them. New growths are fabulous and I am sure that I speak for many many of us that when we see a new growth it's just like when we see a new spike <gasps> you know there's a little bit of that excite moment new growth means new roots and all that great stuff meaning our orchid is doing well and it is getting bigger and going to be producing blooms further down the line should nothing go wrong and there you have it should nothing go wrong that is why Orchid Lingo series today I'm going to be talking about new growths, address the topmost dangers of a new growth coming apart from the fact that we are now happy to have seen it and hopefully be able to give some advice, some tips as to how to avoid doing any damage to our new growths so that further down the line either we get blooms or a seedling matures into a juvenile, matures into a blooming size orchid, and we reap the rewards for our efforts. So let's begin with why new growths fail. And to understand why new growths fail, we need to remember how delicate they are. And if you look really, really close, study the structure to get an understanding of why they are so delicate. You see, they arise as nubbins on the rhizome, and push out pointed spiky growths that push their way out through thick leaves and even have the capacity to come up and out through media that is pretty rough, pretty hard, such as bark or lecker pebbles. So with that, you would think a new growth has some substance to it because if it can do all that and not show any signs of damage, why is it so delicate? Seeing as when left to its own devices, nothing goes wrong and the minute we interfere, oh my goodness, you know, that gut feeling of I've just popped a new growth off and it took next to no effort to do so. The thing is that in themselves as a structure, they are tightly bound by layers of protective sheathing, which protects the innermost growth. But that does not mean that where they are connected to the base of the rhizome, that that tissue isn't very, very weak. So the outer layer does the protecting, it's the connection that is super weak. As long as the outer layer is able to protect what the connection is to the rhizome, the outer layer can do all the pushing and moving away of media if need be. Also, due to their location at the base of the orchid and sheath structure, new growths are vulnerable. We can break them off easily and we <laughs> are the culprits for getting them crushed or bruised, even snapped off during routine handling such as when we have to do the repotting. We must never ever forget that what we see on the outside being able to maneuver media around so that they can grow, the tissue and cells are tender, immature and susceptible to any outside force not of their own making. Pull back a sheath at the base of the orchid and it will easily pop off a new growth that we had no idea was even starting underneath. So the sheath thing is a big, big deal and we'll get to that. But there's another thing we have to be really, really careful of is that our new growths don't rot off because they can retain water between those tightly wrapped protective sheaths, which if it does not receive adequate aeration, can harbor bacteria, fungi, and that leads to rotting of the new growth. Aeration, big word here. Airflow, no matter where you grow your orchids, indoors, outdoors, controlled, without airflow, it is important to keep new growths as dry as possible, or if they do get wet, ideally there's plenty of airflow so that evaporation around the new growth is fast, not even giving bacteria or fungi the chance to settle in. New growths can also dry up. Now the orchid needs adequate humidity and water to grow well. Water is important as it supplies nutrients to the plant. Not providing these conditions can lead to the new growth withering or if it does manage to grow, it will be stunted. Together with water, the lack of nutrients will also affect the healthy and strong development of a new growth. When new nubbins begin to show up, the orchid will push all its resources to aiding the new growth to develop. Any mobile nutrients will be pulled from the older structures of the orchid to ensure the development of the new growth goes according to plan. If 
we don't provide the fertilizer and supplements in sufficient quantity for the orchid, the result will be the new growth may grow, but the rest of the orchid will suffer deficiencies. And also not providing sufficient nutrients can result in the new growth failing completely. That can happen if the orchid is young and does not have enough reserve structures to pull from or even if it does have enough structures, the new growth will develop stunted because the rest of the orchid had some reserves but not enough to grow a sizable growth. Lack of nutrients will also result in a weaker new growth, making it more susceptible to rot as mentioned previously, which is not the same rot as a result of water getting trapped in the sheaths, but rot from weak cells that are more prone to succumb to the attacks of fungi and bacteria. It is always good when it comes to nutrients if you do not have calcium or magnesium in your fertilizer to supplement any orchid that is growing a new growth with calcium and magnesium separately. Calcium is not a mobile nutrient. Magnesium is, but the two work well hand in hand for any new growth to be able to develop properly without the orchid having to draw its resources from back structures. Another thing, huh, new growths are very susceptible to radical temperature fluctuations. If the season is not playing ball and the new growths are already underway because longer daylight hours signals grow time and then there is a drop in temperature, this can cause a new growth to fail completely. It doesn't necessarily mean it's not going to grow, but it will stop growing. And then if the orchid is too weak, that growth will never develop and progress any further because there's not enough energy to start the process again. The hormones that were pushed into that new growth had already been used up. So a temperature fluctuation can set an orchid back. Luckily, our orchids also have a certain biorhythm that their will to survive is much, much stronger. More often than not, that growth will reactivate once temperatures are more favorable. But when it comes to the case of seedlings, it could pose a real, real problem and a threat for the future development of the orchid. And of course, Here's a subject, as mentioned previously, there's not many that I don't like to discuss, but when it comes to pests, wow. New growths are susceptible to attack from pests, such as anything that you can imagine could be a pest, including what I consider human intervention is a pest and a nuisance. <laughs> not just snails, mealybugs, thrips, spider mites, aphids and scale, and if I've missed some, those are included in the list as well. Now we can do something to protect our new growths from getting pest attacks. In cultivation, one of the highly advisable things to do is to remove the outermost dried sheaths as this is where pests can hide. The key word here being dried, do not remove the sheaths when they're still green because they are acting as a protective cover around the connecting tissue to the rhizome. The thing with the sheaths is we have a much better idea what is going on at the base of the orchid once we can remove them because the pests love to hide in those areas where it's dark, it's warm, it's wet and field day. There's a buffet which is juicy, tender and they don't have to put up a big fight to sink their teeth into that tissue. But again, be careful when removing the sheaths. They are there for that reason, referencing that they do protect that tender connective tissue to the rhizome. Now, we always hear about there's nobody in nature taking sheaths off any orchids, so why are we fussed with it in cultivation? My opinion to that is, in cultivation, we do not have the adequate growing conditions where some of these orchids would be living out in nature. What we are trying to do is simulate it so that they will thrive with what we are providing them. But we have to be a little bit more on top of things when it comes to these minutia details of removing sheaths or cutting flower spikes or opening sheaths so that buds can push through because even a simple case of a lack of enough humidity will impede, let's say, the production and development, let's say, of a new growth or a sheath being soft enough to let a new growth through. Humidity plays a huge factor when it comes to these hard sheaths that we peel off in our cultivation. 
Out in nature, with all the humidity around them, those cheese aren't that hard. They deteriorate and degrade much, much faster as well. Also, when it comes to the pest issue out in nature, I consider our orchids are being tender grown. No matter those of us that grow most of our orchids outside for most of the year, they are harder grown. But indoor growers are growing orchids that are tender grown and those orchids would not be able to make it without getting a hardening off process outdoors even though most of those orchids would be living outdoors in their normal natural environment. But normal natural environment are really hard grown orchids that can take the conditions and thrive under those conditions. Even though I grow most of my orchids outdoors most of the year I consider my orchids not hard grown if I were to just put them out in nature and leave them up to their own vices, attaching them to trees even if I had the ideal climate for all my hot growers. They would burn, first of all. New growths, leaves, existing growths, anything that my orchids currently have, if I were to attach them to a tree or put them out in nature, they would not fare very, very well for the first year or two years and they would be majorly set back until they regain their mojo and then are adapted to their newer, harsher conditions. So this whole thing about, well, in nature, nobody's climbing up trees and removing sheaths from new growths or doing X, Y, Z because of pests doesn't apply. There is much more airflow. There's much more humidity where these guys come from. They are much, much more robust as well and much, much more tolerant of the conditions that they are growing in compared to what we are trying to replicate in our own collections, no matter the setup and no matter if it's indoors, greenhouse, outdoors, or a hybrid of all of those combinations. You see, in our climate, for example, let's talk about this she's thing. It's not just because of the pests. We grow most of our orchids in pots and and the sheaths can also get too wet, wicking up moisture from the media, resulting in a wet surrounding for the new growth at the base of the orchid, which poses another risk of rot. And that wouldn't happen in nature because it could be pouring with rain, but the growth habit of the orchid is upside down or pendant in nature, or if a new growth is poking straight up out of the orchid and it's pouring with rain, there is so much airflow the whole thing works in a balance and this is not something that we have when we grow orchids in pots bolt upright where any kind of water can go straight into all the different layers of those protective sheaths surrounding our new growth. Completely different story. So our pots at the surface more often than not are pretty wet and even in a wet dry cycle you will be watering your orchids and pouring water through or if you use the submerged watering method, water will wick up through that organic media and eventually disperse around the surface of the pot. So leaving a sheath on for too long, the outer membranes will absorb some of that humidity and if there's not enough airflow going on, those membranes will be soggy for far too long and eventually the sogginess will penetrate further and further into the new growth, hitting the very tender tissue, connecting it to the rhizome and, well, that new growth will then be history. Now we can also approach the subject of happy sap. It's not a risk per se to a new growth because it is full of nutrients, providing a great source of those to the new growth. Again, it is there for a reason. Now you're gonna say, oh, but it will attract pests. Yes, and you are right. Understandably, happy sap attracts pests of all kinds. The most dealers one being scale and or mealybugs. Now you see in our cultivation once again we might have a watering schedule of once a week or in my case now in the summer I can be liberal in mist and do my thing with my sprayer and any excess of happy sap will be washed away or diluted. Even though there's no guarantee that an orchid or a new growth may attract a certain number of pests at the beginning of a growing season or let's just say your orchid does grow actively throughout the entire year because of your environment allowing it to do so a preventative pest treatment before the orchid starts a new growth is very very good practice just to put it out there going in with whatever insecticide of your choice even if you have to just take a rag and wipe down the pseudobulbs or do something at the base of the rhizome with targeted application i like to use a paintbrush to protect the base already ahead of time of any possible pest attack 
prior to the new growth even starting will 80%, 90% of the time take care of whatever happens with the new growth and its happy sap production. You have put a barrier there for the pests to even grab and get hold. Ants may ignore you because their drive to get at the sugary substance is higher than your pest prevention ever will be and most pest prevention for our orchids does not specifically target ants. They seem to be immune to any kind of insecticide but ants are a good thing because if you are not like me where I can go around now liberally with my sprayer and dilute any excess happy sap, not because I'm doing it on purpose but it's just the name of the game when you spray water on the surface of your orchids you will dilute happy sap but if you're not in the position to be able to do that, know that the ants are actually there that will help control the excess happy sap no amount of ants is going to be able to consume all the happy sap an orchid can produce but they will control a little bit the excess and take it all back to their family and they'll be back for more so if you see ants on your new growths they are not a threat to your new growths as a matter of fact they are helping keeping that happy sap in check and it's a harmony it's a little bit of a dance between what the orchid does and what the ants want so they're kind of you know like a sucker fish cleaning off a whale they are all working together this is a great thing because the sugary substance can also attract bacteria and fungi which could result in rot if the happy sap is not kept in check you can also if you don't have ants in your collection just wipe it off with a very, very lightly damp tissue. If you go in with dry tissue, you're not going to do much wiping. You're going to do more spreading. But if you take a paper towel and just dampen it lightly and very, very gently wipe off that new growth and excess happy sap if you don't have ants to help you out. Now, vigilance is always, always key when it comes to avoiding any kind of problems. The importance of inspecting your orchids for pests, new growths, any signs of disease or deficiencies in older structures cannot be stressed enough. If daily walkabouts in your collection is a limited thing and you don't have time on your side, then a good time to do a thorough once over is when it comes time to water your orchids. Avoid damaging new growths by not getting water on them if you do not have high enough temperatures. And airflow to guarantee fast evaporation of the moisture staying on the new growths too long. If water gets trapped in those fresh protective sheaths, it does not dry fast. Seeing as the newly formed cells are somewhat wet, or a better word would be juicy, in their very nature. Because look, have you ever been in a meadow and you've laid back and you've pulled a grass stalk or something, one of those long grassy stalks, and you've chewed at the end of that grass stalk and it was kind of sweet and tender and then you had another grass stalk and another grass stalk the lower part is tender it's juicy it's sweet and that is what the pests can sink their teeth into easily i remember eating lots of grasses until i got to the drier part and then nope i was done with it then i pulled another bit of grass and started nibbling away at the base of that it was always sweet and juicy i wonder if you've done that let me know <laughs> right now i probably wouldn't advise it because of you know secondary repercussions but back then I never thought of any secondary repercussions that could affect my health one bit <laughs> but raising the temperatures and airflow will speed up the evaporation process of any water that may have gotten into any new growth now be very very careful though if you have high humidity in your environment be extra careful about getting too much water in your new growth because Despite high temperatures and despite having high airflow to boot, humidity means there's water in the air and it will not aid in drying out a new growth fast. Just know that no matter how much airflow you have, if you have super high humidity continuously, and I'm talking 80% and up, on top of that it may rain, no amount of airflow is going to dry out those new growths. If you have those kinds of circumstances, your best bet is to make sure that you give your orchid enough 
nutrients so that the cells can grow really really strong supplement with calcium and magnesium if you are in those kind of environments so that the membrane and the fibers in those cells can really connect and build strength and more often than not you should have absolutely no problem in very humid and wet environments to grow beautiful new growths usually in climates like that it is possible to have your orchids attached to your garden fence your tree trunks your branches etc and at that point then i would actually always attach the orchid upside down so that it grows pendant as opposed to upright because in that way no matter how wet it gets no matter how high the humidity is and your airflow may not be able to counteract when a new growth is facing upside down actually the right way it is upside down for us but for the orchid it is the right way then it is protected for long enough until some of the structures that we have in our orchids will actually grow up right and upwards towards the light but by the time it does that all the delicate part will have already matured and hardened off to a degree that when the leaves open up there will be no threat of rot the orchids know best us growing our orchids upright in a pot that is not what they would do not from the get-go some orchids will stay in a pendant growth habit others by the weight of their growth will start to go into a pendant growth habit having started their life cycle bolt upright and others will grow downwards and then curl upwards towards the light only once they are mature enough and ready to do so and that is something we need to take into consideration cultivating orchids in an artificial environment even though in my case it is as natural as i possibly can get but it is artificial in a sense that none of these orchids would be living outside right now if the temperatures were too cold or if i didn't have them in a self-watering setup to counteract my lack of humidity so i hope that that makes sense it is not necessarily the fact you're growing your orchids outside or inside new growths are tender new growths are susceptible to all kinds of threats those that we can't see those that we can see and then there is that percentage of us who are the actual threat to any new growth <laughs> This was quite a long video. As I said right at the start, it's one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> and especially now this time of year, when let's say most of the orchids are kicking into active growth, those orchids that are not necessarily hybrids that grow all year round, I find it important and I hope that this video was helpful and not too tedious and repetitive. Sometimes my repetitiveness is there for a reason, because if I emphasize a word 20 minutes ago and I don't bring it up again, well, it just falls as part of the information of the general video. But if I repeat something like airflow, water or humidity in different combinations of a threat to a new growth, there's a reason for that. It's because they are very, very important to keep in mind while we want to keep our orchids safe. Pests are the easiest culprit to keep under control and keep our new growth safe. The environment, not so much. That is what we're trying to tweak when we cultivate orchids in a private collection. Anyway, having said all that, let me know in the comments if you have any questions or if you would like to add to the topic. I'm always happy to see that people are adding information, especially if people are reading comments for additional information. It helps everybody get a broader perspective so that their new growths will eventually form into blooms. Happy days. Win-win. Win for the orchid, win for us growers. Really, really appreciate your time if you've made it all the way through to the end. I wish you a fabulous, beautiful day. Day on one condition though that you please stay safe. Take care. Bye!